option at that time to ask a question, you may press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now I'll turn today's meeting over to Carl Yonder. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you for joining us for the Bureau of Health Workforce Grand Rounds webinar series, Integrating Opioid Use Disorder Treatment into Healthy Workforce Training webinar. Today's presentation and additional materials can be downloaded by clicking on the files located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. When the files are highlighted, you can click the Save to My Computer button. You can then save the files in a location of your choice. At the conclusion of all of the presentations today, there will be an opportunity to ask questions over the phone and online. The operator, the operator will provide you all with instructions on how to submit a question over the phone. And if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them into the chat pod located at the bottom of the screen. I'd now like to thank you all again for joining us today, and we hope that you find the webinar incredibly helpful. I'll now turn the presentation over to Commander Kent Forty. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my uh, thanks, and, and just join Carl in welcoming you to our, our webinar today. So today's webinar is titled Integrating Opioid Use Disorder Treatment into Health Workforce Training. We're going to hear from five subject matter experts from across the spectrum of our uh, health workforce and specific to opioid use disorder. Our purpose today is to highlight innovative resources, guidelines, and trainings for health professionals to combat the opioid epidemic with the three objectives. One, provide an overview of opioid epidemic and treatment options. Two, discuss tools and models for training opportunities to broaden addiction medicine. And three, to share innovative practices and upcoming opportunities to combat opioid substance use disorders. Like I said, we've got five subject matter experts and we really hope to have a dynamic dialogue and conversation throughout the event. And please uh, type in your questions as they come up. And we'll address them if we have time at the end. Uh, I do want to point folks to uh, two different uh, and specific resources. Uh, one on the HRSA website, hrsa.gov backslash opioids, and also hhs.gov backslash opioids. Very specific, very uh, uh, timely resources there but please do go there as well, and I'm sure our speakers will touch on those points at some uh, point in their presentation. And finally, before we go into the, the speakers, I want to just touch on the HHS five-point strategy to combat opioid uh, crisis. One is better addiction prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Two, better data. Three is better pain management. Four, better targeting of overdose reversing drugs, and five, is better research. I'm assured that the five speakers will touch on those points in some way, shape, or form, and we're happy to have them. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, and, bef and before I want to acknowledge my co-moderator, uh, Lauren Pink Pinkney, she and I will be the moderator for the Q&A as well as introducing the speakers. So uh, to introduce Dr. Jan uh, Losby, she's a team lead for health systems Division of Unintentional Injury Prevention at the CDC National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. Dr. Losby, please begin your presentation. Great, thanks so very much and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with everyone today. And um, I really appreciate the time to be a part of this uh, panel and to address this broad uh, public health issue and to be a part of the discussion with my fellow presenters. In just a moment, I don't have the slide control. I don't know if somebody else is able to, to moderate and to um, move the slides forward, if that's possible. Yes, we'll take care of that in one second. Oh, fantastic. OK, so I'll just give some background in terms of what I'll cover. So I will start with a brief overview of the data trends related to the opioid overdose epidemic. And then I'll share some of CDC's priority areas and really focus on the tools and resources that can help inform the evidence-based prescribing that might be of particular interest to this audience. I can't see the slides advancing, but are they advancing on your end? We're running into a slight technical glitch. We should have it worked out uh, shortly. Okay. All right, well, I will just proceed. When the first slide appears, it really shows the 
three waves of the rise in the opioid overdose deaths in the United States. And, and as some background, drug overdose deaths, including those involving opioids, continue to increase in the United States. And deaths from drug overdose are up among both men and women, all races, and adults of nearly all ages. Overdose deaths from opioids, including prescription opioids and heroin or illicitly made fentanyl, have increased by more than five times since 1999. In 2016, more than 42,000 people died from an overdose involving opioids, and 40% of those deaths were from prescription opioids. So this is one epidemic that has three waves to, do, to it, and I will briefly describe each of those waves so you can get a sense of how the epidemic has changed over time in the United States. The first wave of the epidemic was prescription opioids, and its toll is still quite high. Over 183,000 people have died from overdoses involving prescription opioids in the United States in the last 15 years. And deaths related to natural and semi-synthetic opioids, which include the most commonly prescribed opioids, such as oxycodone and hydrocodone. When you see the graph, it'll be the purple line. And these increased fourfold between 1999 and 2011. These prescription opioids continue to be involved in many overdose deaths. The second wave of the opioid epidemic is heroin. Excuse me. Heroin is available in larger quantities and used by a larger number of people and is, in, as, and is causing an increasing number of overdose deaths. Heroin-related death rate, or the orange line on the graph that you will see, has increased over four, fourfold since 2010. Heroin is most available in the Northeast and areas of the Midwest. According to the DEA, heroin seizures in the United States are 2.5 times higher in 2016 compared to 2010. The DEA reports that most heroin is entering the United States across Mexico, the predominant source for heroin with 80% of the market share, and are expanding eastward with sophisticated transportation and distribution networks. Beyond greater availability, increased purity and lower costs of heroin have also played a role in the growth of heroin use. Per milligram, heroin is one-tenth the cost of prescription opioids. The third wave in the opioid epidemic is fentanyl, shown in the black line on the graph. Fentanyl is a synthetic and short-acting opioid analgesic and is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. It is a drug that's approved for management of acute or chronic pain associated with advanced cancer. Although prescription fentanyl can be diverted for misuse and abuse, most cases of fentanyl-related morbidity and mortality is linked to illicitly manufactured fentanyl laced with heroin. The death rate for synthetic opioids has tripled in the last two years. Beyond its potency, the low production cost makes fentanyl very attractive to drug traffickers. For example, heroin costs about $65,000 per kilogram wholesale, whereas illicit fentanyl, usually sourced from China, is available at roughly $3,500 per kilogram. And that one kilogram of fentanyl is cut with 16 to 24 kilograms of heroin or other street drugs, yielding a profit of about $1.3 million. Before leaving this slide, I wish to note that there might be a fourth wave of the opioid epidemic with increases in deaths from cocaine and other psychostimulants, such as methamphetamine and ecstasy. Earlier this year, CDC released a more detailed analysis of drug overdose deaths in 2016. The death rate for cocaine increased 52% and psychostimulants increased 33% in one year. This continues a trend that began in the last few years. In turning to the next slide, uh, to fully grasp the devastating impact of this public health emergency, we need to marry the stories of lives lost with pictures of data. The epidemic is far-reaching and touching every community across our nation. Many of us have been affected directly or indirectly. Loved ones, family members, friends, coworkers, neighbors struggle with opioid use or addiction. 
Each of those personal stories of tragedy make up these pictures too. This time series map shows county level drug overdose mortality rates shifting between 2000 and 2016. Where once the slides are up, you'll see that the red and orange have the higher overdose death rates in the United States. Drug overdoses are among the few causes of death that are on the rise, and the trends, as evidenced here, are stark and unrelenting. Every state has been dramatic, has seen dramatic increases in mortality rates, with some states in Appalachia and the Northeast and Southwest being most, the most hardest hit. At CDC, we have five priority areas that actually map on quite um, in, in terms of alignment to the broader five strategies of HHS that were just mentioned. Ours focus on prevention and complement the work of other federal agencies such as HRSA, CMS, and SAMHSA. They are to improve data quality and track trends, to monitor the epidemic, to enhance patient safety by supplying healthcare providers with data, tools, and guidance for evidence-based decision-making, to strengthen state efforts by scaling up effective public health interventions, partnering with public safety as the epidemic has moved into illicit drugs, and also empowering consumers to make safe choices. In 2016, CDC released an opioid prescribing guideline for primary care providers for chronic pain outside of active cancer, palliative, and end-of-life care. This is intended for outpatient settings and for patients 18 years or older. A guideline was needed to better align opioid prescribing practices in primary care settings with the best available evidence to ensure safer, more effective pain management. CDC is a non-regulatory agency, and as such, the guideline is not a rule, statute, or law. The guideline is intended to help inform clinicians' discussions and decisions with patients and their uh, prescribing decisions based upon the best available evidence about benefits and risks of opioid use. The CDC guideline has 12 recommendations grouped into three conceptual areas determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain, opioid selection, dosage, duration, follow-up, and discontinuation, assessing risk and addressing harms of opioid use. Opioids, and I'll just give a couple of examples of their recommendation statements. So for example, um, opioids not being the first line or routine therapy for chronic pain, using caution when increasing dosages, especially greater than 50 morphine milligram equivalent, or justifying escalating above 90 morphine milligram equivalent, checking prescription drug monitoring programs, or PDMPs, for other prescriptions or high total dosages, avoiding concurrent benzodiazepine and opioid prescriptions, and offering or arranging medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. In thinking about a way to help encourage uptake and use of the guideline, CDC created and developed a comprehensive implementation approach that has four areas. And I'll just briefly touch on those and really uh, focus on the resource resources that might be of most interest to this audience. So the four quadrants are translation and communication, education and training, health system interventions, and insurer interventions. So just touching on the translation and communication, basically what this is is taking the science that's contained in the guideline and making the content accessible, broken into smaller units through tools such as fact sheets and checklists, and we also have a mobile app. Um, once you have access to the slides, you can download any of these free resources, and we have uh, fact, fact sheets intended for clinicians on the following topics, a checklist for prescribing, calculating dosage, checking the PDMPs, assessing risks and benefits. Uh, we also have created a mobile app to help calculate morphine milligram equivalents, or MMEs. And the app also includes an interactive tool to help primary care providers communicate with patients about the risks and benefits of opioids. We've also included a tapering pocket guide, and this is looking at um, 
for those patients who perhaps are already on high morphine milligram equivalents and there's an assessment with the clinician around pain and function, um, you know, might be determined based on that conversation, a, a decrease is um, in the best interest of the patient, if that's the case. Um, we've provided some information around tapering, such as uh, if some patients have taken opioids for a long period of time, they might benefit from a perhaps low decrease, such as 10% decrease per month. And all of that information is available on the slides. In turning to uh, clinician education and training, we also offer free online training, such as webinars and web-based modules, so clinicians can learn about the content of the guideline while earning CME or CE. On the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see um, online series to help providers apply CDC's recommendations in clinical settings through interactive patient scenarios, videos, knowledge checks, tips, and resources. Four modules have been launched, and we have six more in production. The ones that are currently available are focused on reducing the risks of opioids, communicating with patients, treating chronic pain without opioids, and addressing the opioid epidemic. On the right-hand part of the slide, you'll see that CDC has partnered with CDC's Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, or COCA, and the University of Washington to present a webinar series about the CDC guidelines. We have seven one-hour webinars that are available for free online, and health professionals can obtain continuing education credits as well for these. In terms of patient education, uh, CDC launched last year the CDC Rx Awareness Campaign to increase awareness and knowledge among Americans about the risks of prescription opioids and to increase the number of people who avoid non-medical or recreational use. Based on past success using testimonials such as CDC's Top Smoking Tips campaign to effectively communicate about complex and sensitive health behaviors, CDC incorporated first-person stories into this public campaign. We developed a series of videos and television ads that feature individuals living in recovery individuals recovering from opioid use disorder, and family members who have lost someone to prescription opioid overdose. Currently, 27 states are using the content contained in this campaign, and all of this material is available online for free. I'd also like to show, um, show all of you that um, CDC is also currently working with 45 states in addition to Washington, D.C. in their state public health departments. We launched the Overdose Prevention and in States Initiative to help make a difference in states, given that states regulate the health professions, run prescription drug monitoring programs, or PDMPs, administer large public insurance programs such as Medicaid or workers' compensation, and have the public health surveillance capacity to track the epidemic. We structured this evidence-based program to enhance and maximize the use of PDMPs, implement community or insurer or health system interventions, conduct evaluations to see if changes in state policy and regulations are making a difference, such as pill mill laws, Good Samaritan laws, or naloxone training and distribution programs, and enhance the quality and timeliness of surveillance data. And finally, as a part of this program, we have rapid response projects. This gives states the flexibility on a year-to-year -year basis to redirect or target a hotspot area or issue, depending upon what's emerging in their jurisdiction. And you might be interested in seeing the uh, map when it's available to see if your own state is funded. In the last two slides, I included a graphic that outlines the coordinated activities that can be helpful to, to have in place in communities that are um, a cross-sector collaboration. For example, local health departments can use emergency department data to alert the community about a surge in overdoses, or emergency departments can provide naloxone to high-risk patients to prevent further overdoses and or link these patients to mental health and substance use treatment providers. Public safety and law enforcement can identify changes in the illicit drug supply of an area and can quickly respond and coordinate with local partners. Finally, community-based organizations are often able to mobilize a community response to those most at risk, especially um, mobilizing harm reduction services. 
a coordinated response plan is key, and CDC is helping to facilitate these prevention, preparedness, and response activities in many communities and states. The final slide is a list of all of the resources, and hopefully um, folks will find these interested, and feel free to download them and share them with um, your, within your practices or with your partners. So thank you so very much. And apologies that the slides haven't been uh, available, but hopefully you can uh, look at them later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lozby. That was great. What a wealth of resources, and, and I do encourage everybody to take a look and uh, download what is you know, helpful for you. A lot of great resources. Thank you again. So moving on, we're um, moving into a, a different role with Catherine Cates Wessel. She is the CEO of American Academy of Addiction Psychi Psychi Psychiatry. She's a principal investigator and project director of Providers Clinical Support System and the State Targeted Response Technical Assistance Initiative. Without further ado, Catherine, would you please begin your presentation? Hi, thank you so much for having me, and I've already learned a lot from uh, the previous pr uh, presenter, so I just, it echoes our feeling at AAAP, which is what we call American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, uh, is there is a lot of resources and a lot of um, opportunities to collaborate, and that really is kind of the essence of what we're about, and we feel coalitions working together is really uh, the best approach and try not to recreate the wheel. So I want to be tapping into the resources that she mentioned and hope others can find um, our resources useful as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, a big part of who we are is about coalitions. And so when we, we started out with the um, Providers Clinical Support System, which is funded by SAMHSA, it really is setting up a, um, a support system around education and training for health professionals. And uh, initially it started out to be directed towards physicians, and it was called Physicians Clinical Support System. They then migrated it to prescription uh, to prescribers clinical support system and actually our coalition advocated with SAMHSA and we said it needs to be providers. It's a multidisciplinary issue and we know that it, it impacts the whole team and so we felt very strongly and fortunately uh, SAMHSA supported that and came back and changed it to providers clinical support system. And the idea is to provide training and mentoring um, in evidence-based practices targeting the primary care community. So we're not trying to make everyone to be addiction specialists. Uh, we're really trying to help the medical community get caught up in the things that they should have been taught in and hopefully going forward uh, we'll have the basics on uh, prevention, identification, and treatment of all substance use disorders, but with a focus on opioid use disorders and the treatment of chronic pain. So originally there were two uh, projects. One was looking at the intersection of chronic pain uh, and opioid use disorder, and the second one was looking at the medications. Uh, those two projects have come together um, and formed the Providers Clinical Support System. So as you look at the list of people, uh, of organizations, I'm not going to go through it because it's a huge list. Uh, collectively, between our partner organizations and our steering committee, it represents over a million health professionals. So as you see, there's um, uh, the major players in primary care, it's, uh, we have nurses and we have dentists and we have uh, the counselors and, and so forth. So we have a huge number and we feel very strongly because uh, in, in the field of medicine, uh, psychiatry is somewhat stigmatized and you add addiction along with the psychiatry and with double whammy. Uh, so most health professionals are not going to come to an addiction psychiatry or addiction organization to get their training and education. Um, they're going to go to their primary um, academic society. So we wanted to partner with a lot of these other organizations that I'm sure you're familiar with in helping get the word out. Again, having them help uh, direct us and guide us on what they feel is needed, but then also making the resources available. So anyone uh, can take any of the trainings, uh, and before I forget, everything is free, free, free. Uh, I sometimes forget to mention that um, it's typically online, uh, but there are some um, waiver training for those going for the um, uh, waiver to prescribe buprenorphine. There's eight hours for the physician and 24 hours for the nurse practitioner and the PA. All those resources are available. You can either do them online. You can do a half and half, what's half online and half uh, otherwise. Um, but the, the whole goal is to make it as easy as possible and as flexible for the health professional. So um, 
each of the organizations uh, will be given X dollars of money from the grant. We divide it up, and everybody creates training directed towards their constituents or their members to make sure the disciplines have the um, the ability to define what their own discipline needs. So nurses can set it up for nurses and dentists, but anybody can take training with anybody else. Um, CME and CE credits are also provided. So again, we're really trying to get all of health professionals in. There has been a primary focus on prescribers, but as uh, we've gotten uh, better in looking at systems and the implementation issues, we know it's a huge barrier not to get the full team on board because uh, the prescribers need the other support in providing the care. So what types of trainings do we do? We have a huge number of types of trainings, um, and just to give you a sense of uh, since the starting of the grant, um, how many have we had? Um, we have uh, trained uh, over 125,000 participants. Um, we have over 600 webinars and online modules. Um, we also have um, small group discussions. In our mentoring program, not only can you have a one-on-one -on -one discussion if you'd like, you can also have small group discussions, and they're on a, um, a conference call with an expert on a particular topic. And what happens is we ask the participants, it's limited to 10 people at a time, with an expert to provide a clinical case or a question in advance. And then the um, expert can prepare in advance, and then they talk about them um, on the phone and it's really helpful because that's how health professionals typically learn, is discussing cases and so forth. So we want to make it, again, as user-friendly as possible. Waiver trainings, we've trained over 24,000 participants. Um, and again, um, various modalities of doing that, sometimes face-to-face -face in an eight-hour course, sometimes a half and half, and then sometimes um, online. And then um, we have about 813 mentees um, and continue to grow, um, but still letting people know that it's out there um, is, is really important. In the mentoring program, I think it's even more important to understand is how we've tried to set it up. We have addiction specialists, we have uh, pain specialists, and then we have primary care providers that aren't particularly experts, but they have expertise in um, training and have um, the skills to treat people with opioid use disorders um, in, in particular and the use of um, medications and prescribing. So we have those people and they've all been vetted um, and then they're available uh, online for people to uh, sign up to be with them. We have a three-tiered approach. Uh, I sometimes make the comparison to speed dating. Um, what happens is, is nowadays, you know, when you think about mentoring, people don't think about a long-term relationship. They think about, I want a question, I want to, I have a question. I want to have a reputable source to go to, and then I leave. I'm done. So they, uh, we call it speed mentoring. They go in, they, they get somebody to talk to, they get their resource, they get their information, and then they know where to come back, um, but they're not necessarily interested in speaking to the person regularly or, or, or really uh, an educational long-term relationship. But there are people that really want that. They want to have someone that they can uh, meet with uh, regularly and talk through cases and discuss things, so we have that opportunity. The other uh, approach um, also allows for just posting a question um, up on a uh, discussion forum that's managed by an addiction specialist. And I have to say, quite rapidly, you'll get a lot of comments back on that. It is moderated, so we just don't let people just run off on various tangents, which sometimes can happen when you have an unmonitored um, discussion forum. But it really is thoughtful. Um, and people enjoy having that opportunity to share their experiences but get insight from experts um, on various topics. So the mentoring program has, has been very helpful. The other thing that we have um, tried to address is, again, the need to meet um, the nurse practitioner and PA needs because as of last year, they too can prescribe, which is wonderful and, and helping us really expand the workforce needs. And so in response, we developed uh, an eight-hour course and then the 16-hour course uh, that is part to make up the 24 hours. We also have uh, an infographic uh, that you can look at and you can see um, the steps that you go through because it can be very confusing for people. Uh, I did an eight-hour course <clears throat> here um, in, a, in an annual meeting, but now I need 16 hours. Can I do them separately? Do I have to do them together? And then what do I, where do I go to submit my paperwork? So we try to make it, again, as simple as possible to kind of clarify to people. 
Let me just clarify one thing. I've had some people call me and say, why is it that the nurse practitioners, the PAs, have to do 24 hours and the physicians do eight hours? And as if we made that decision, we did not. That's a federally mandated um, uh, ruling. So that has nothing to do with our organization. We're just carrying it out and, and making the, re the resources available and also having uh, mentors for each of the disciplines as well um, because there are different perspectives that are needed and so forth. So again, this is all free of charge um, and we pay for the trainer um, to come. If it's a face-to-face, -face, we pay for uh, their time and their travel and so forth. Another big, huge area that we know, and I'm sure you all have heard this as well, is, is before you go out and talk about um, the issues around substance use disorders, and, and, and particularly opioid use disorders, stigma is by far one of the biggest barriers. And people will say, well, you know, people get the waiver, but they don't prescribe. Why is that? <clears throat> Why don't more people prescribe? But if you look at the data more and more, people get the waiver, but they don't prescribe. And they'll, they'll take the waiver course more than one time sometimes. And then they... Um, or they'll prescribe for one or two people, or then you get the other end of the spectrum that they're at their max and they want to increase it. But the, by far, the largest majority of them don't uh, prescribe at all. And so why is that? And so we we spent a lot of time looking at that because we are one of the um, four Data 2000 organizations that provide the training to get the waiver. Uh, the, our academy, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry is one. The American Psychiatric Association is one. Um, the American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, and then the American Society of Addiction and Medicine. All four of us are, uh, as a part of this coalition in the PCSS, and provide the training. Um, and we all know that it's it's a it's a, a variety of factors. One of the biggest is stigma. Um, the health professionals don't feel comfortable, they say, with this population of patients. They don't feel comfortable with the disorder. They haven't been trained adequately. So while they take the eight-hour uh, waiver course, it really doesn't help them on how to manage the patient. It's how, how do you engage the patient? How do you approach your patient and say, I think you have a, a drug problem with illegal use of drugs? So it, it, it's really an uncomfortable um, uh, situation. Um, so in there's some people say, I don't want those patients in my, in my office. We've had people say that. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to dispel a lot, some of the stigma. We did a project with the American Hospital Association around this as well on why it's important for every staff person in a healthcare setting to be aware of language. I don't know if you've heard of the, this, one of the campaigns at Boston um, Medical Center. It's called Words Matter. It's really important because thinking about calling someone an addict or that they have a dirty urine or um, other terms that have been traditionally used can be very hard for someone in recovery or considering to um, start in recovery um, or to start treatment. So we've really tried to help um, people understand better. And one is to try to get the health professionals. So if you see those video on the right, we're not going to show them on here, but I wanted to just give you a sense of them. The one on the right is talking, uh, this is a primary care provider talking about, from her perspective, how this is like the, the HIV epidemic. And this is a real opportunity for health professionals to step up, um, that you're needed and it's really important uh, to be a part of the solution. Um, and so it, it's very, very positive. It's very um, uh, hopeful. It's a, a lot of what we hear in the opioid use disorder, rightfully so, is very you know devastating and a lot of death. But there's also a lot of positive that comes out of it because it's really breaking down those barriers and people are, are hearing about everyone's impacted about it. It's not a particular population. It's not the uh, uneducated. It's you know it's everybody. And so uh, as health professionals, how can we change the way we view people with a opioid use disorder or with uh, substance use disorder. The one on the left-hand side is talking about how rewarding it is to work with this population and, and what it means to be able to transform a person's life, and sometimes in a very short period of time. Um, another, again, empowering kind of positive approach that we're really trying to get out because it is about dispelling a lot of myths. Um, we'll have health professionals say to us, well, what do I do if these patients start yelling at me when they come in my clinic or stealing things from me? And so we're trying to give a, a view of what can be positive that comes out of it. So um, we have about 26 video clips on, on our website. Again, it's all free. Feel free to make use of them. It's under educational resources. 
And we have another one that the patients have done of how, how important it is to them to have a caring, thoughtful, non-judgmental health professional who um, welcomes them and speaks to them by the first name and looks at them. Um, it really encourages them to want to come back. And that's another big um, challenge to overcome. Another thing that we've been working on, uh, so a lot of our stuff is focused on the individual uh, health professional. And one thing that we know is, is that um, it's more, again, as more than just the individual prescriber. You know, it takes a village. It takes a team. Um, and so we wanted to look at what happens um, at a local level. And so we've, we've chosen, initially it was five states. We've now gone to include two more states. And what we've done is we've gone in and we've formed a relationship with a, one clinical site. We take a clinical uh, expert team in. We do a needs assessment. We complete um, and define what are the barriers to overcome in providing evidence-based practices. They provide a multidisciplinary team. And then we meet with them once a month on a phone call. And we talk about how can we provide you with technical assistance, training, education, support to build a system. Because it really is about systems. That's another barrier that health professionals say, well, nobody else on my team understands this. I took the waiver course, but now what do I do? So it really is about how to integrate this into their, to their primary care setting. And so we help them build the system, walk them through the process, and then um, help them get it on board. And so we found it to be extremely um, useful, beneficial. Uh, one example is in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a husband and wife team, Drs. Peck and Peck. Uh, she is an OBGYN, um, and he, they, he started out prescribing. Their CEO was totally on board from the start. Let's do this, which is huge. Having a medical champion and having support from the senior um, organization is critical. Once you have that, it really goes fast. And what they've been able to do, they started out with one clinic. They now have 12 clinics that are prescribing. They um, are now being integrated into a larger hospital, and they said, we are doing this throughout the hospital. Every uh, prescriber is required to take um, the provider's clinical support system, uh, 14 module core curriculum on pain. Um, it's, everybody needs to know it, they said. Um, and so that's a requirement. Um, people will be expected to take the waiver course. They're not required to get the waiver, but they are expected to be uh, uh, familiar with it and aware. And Dr. Peck, on the, uh, the OBGYN on the right, uh, Mrs. Peck says, for her, providing uh, care for these people is more rewarding for her than delivering ch babies, which I was blown away. It's like, how is that possible? What she said, they are so grateful and gracious in it is just uh, a very powerful uh, thing to be involved with. So what have we learned? Champions are critical, uh, multi-level training, um, being flexible in your structure. It has to be local issues. What's happening in this clinic could be very different from what's happened across the street, but you also have to be aware of what's happening uh, with the policies and reimbursement and so forth. Uh, accountability is key, collaboration, and being able to process things. Take, it does take time. And sometimes people want to say, well, we've trained. Why, haven't we, why aren't we moving? But you're talking about real uh, cultural change and systems change. Um, across the board, you need to train. It's not just the prescriber. It's everybody from the front desk, uh, understanding workflow, um, how to identify people. Another big challenge and a barrier is access to behavioral health. We know it's not just prescribing medication. A large number of people that tend to have opioid use disorders often have co-occurring mental disorders. And a lot of times that's not, not talked about. I hear it all the time. People say, oh, yeah, that's complicated. But it, it, it's the core of a problem for a lot of people. And they're often at risk for self-harm and uh, suicide. Uh, looking at uh, chronic care systems are important, basic systems, templates and forms and checklists, as was mentioned earlier, um, and then talking about prescription access and authorization. So it does take time, um, but it is vital to change. And the other project I wanted to mention, so everyone hope you will take time and check out the PCSS. Also, the STRTA, which is the, strategic, uh, the State Targeted Response Technical Assistance, uh, we have a lot of the same pr uh, partner organizations, and any technical assistance um, anyone in any of the states and territories needs, uh, if you you can submit a request through getstrta.org, and it's all free of charge from 
having someone to come in who's an implementation scientist to a waiver course to uh, a prevention or recovery um, technical assistance support, and it's paid for through the grant. So again, that's free of charge. So there's a lot of resources out there and a lot of um, opportunities to take what's already been done. So I encourage you not to recreate the will. Um, we really want to um, support and enhance each other, fill in gaps. So if there are needs that you have, uh, let us know and we'll do our best. Thank you. Thank you, Captain, for that great presentation on Providers Clinical Support System and STRPA. I'm sure our participants will find the resources on your website helpful for opioid training and mentoring. That was great. Next, we will hear from Drs. Chaik Dubini and Heather Kusarit at the National Center for Integrated Behavioral Health and Primary Care at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Lauren, for your introduction. Um, this is Chaik Darbeni, and Heather Klusteris is also here as well. Uh, we are pleased to be part of this webinar and grand rounds. And we are funded by HRSA to uh, be one of six sites or centers around the country to provide training in various aspects of primary care related to uh, improving access to care and outcomes for patients in primary care. Our center is a national center for integrated behavioral health in primary care, and it's good to go third um, because a lot of the things that we are doing are uh, very synergistic with the two prior presentations. And also the study we've been talking about uh, is really uh, very, very resonates very well with the last presentation as well. The National Center for Integrated Behavioral Health is a transdisciplinary partnership uh, that was created with this funding uh, vision is to improve access to the highest quality of care for mental health and substance use disorder. And, and we had to break these two apart because realizing that they are actually two different uh, areas that people see as distinct but really interrelated as said earlier. Our mission is to prepare clinicians or primary care clinicians with the expertise and leadership for integrated behavioral health in primary care and you can see objectives on the right-hand side. And we, we seek to enable implementation of IBH training and practice. And, and it is training and practice, as I said earlier, because we found that these two things go together. You cannot train when the practice is not in place and the models are actually not in place. It's really hard to do that in theory. And we also seek to identify and disseminate best practices of scalable IBH training in the professional setting in a primary care environment. And, of course, we'll talk about our research uh, as well, but uh, we all also catalyze co-learning and research within a community of practice, and we invite each and every one of you to check us out and look at our website, ncibh.org, and to join our community of practice because the more people we have sharing your experiences and expertise, the, the better and stronger we will be in this important work. So we... Um, did a study um, that is informed largely in part by the experiences that you've all heard about. Most patients uh, who have behavioral health issues, mental health sub substance use, actually in primary care. And, and unfortunately, I'm a primary care physician. We're not able to diagnose them as readily. And even when they're diagnosed, we find that the treatment is not often adequate. And the partnership with uh, mental health providers or specialists in psychiatry is not often strong enough in these IBH models in primary care currently to provide the best care that is needed for the best outcomes. With this um, initial studies, and you can see from this slide, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm about these models. We also know that uh, perhaps some of these responses uh, don't reflect what's going on. But suffice to say that we found that there is a bit of appetite out there for these models and training in behavioral health in primary care. What we need to do is to create a resources environment to be able to make it happen and improve uh, uh, training and expertise in behavioral health care. The other thing that we don't have here that's also very important is that behavioral health specialists are trained in one area or different uh, environments, and primary care providers are trained in different environments, often don't coexist in the same place in their training or IPE settings and are brought together to practice and sometimes lead to uh, perhaps unwelcome outcomes. One survey that we feel is really important that informed this uh, uh, study we're talking about is one that discovered or reported that uh, providers are actually less comfortable. So you talk about mental health issues, they're even less comfortable with treating substance disorder or, or UD 
than they are with mental health issues. That tells you we have a problem and we need to act and act uh, with solutions that are effective and, and are received in this uh, um, environment. So we, with the help of HRSA, created the Learning Collaborative. Uh, Heather is my partner in crime in this work. And you can see the aims. I'm not going to read through all of them in the interest of time. Uh, but suffice it to say that our ultimate goal, number four, which is phase two of this project, was seek to identify the, the key components that um, um, characterize successful programs. In other words, what's that secret sauce that will allow programs to be successful, and how do we replicate this across other setting, which is really our core uh, mission, is to identify best practices and spread them around uh, so everyone can use them. So we use a familiar CIFR uh, model, uh, which is a consolidated framework of implementation research. We employ the purposes sample or sampling method of rural and urban programs to give us a fairly representative uh, group of programs. And these are all MAT awardees of HRSA. And we work with HRSA to identify them and uh, uh, work with them also to do the 30 minute interviews. The interviews themselves were structured to help us to characterize the factors that affected implementation of MAT training. Uh, again, we, we sometimes find it difficult to tell which one is training and which one is actual practice, but you need to have the practice again before the training can occur. Uh, these are some of the results, and, and we are happy to provide more information. The models that are used for training, the examples that are used for these models vary across settings. Um, of course, you know there are many training models that exist, uh, but um, um, uh, so these are just examples of some of those we found. CDC is a popular site for people to use for examples of uh, models for training, and uh, the PCMH model, obviously, I'm partial to it and because I'm primary care physician. But I, I think it gives you a sense that people are still trying to understand and grapple with what is really the best way to train primary care providers and IBH, and what should the training actually look like, and what do we train them? Do we train them in models or train them in how to diagnose and treat uh, opioid disorder and behavioral health issues? And, and I think this continues to be an area of evolution that uh, I'm sure will become clearer. I want to go quickly to some of our key findings. Again, we'll echo some of the points that have been made earlier. Um, so these, uh, we broke these down for the sake of this presentation to facilitators and, and barriers to integrated behavioral health. And let me talk a little bit about uh, the facilitators and, and um, you know, offering CMEs and having time to do the training were really important components, incentives to, pro, uh, to prescribe, uh, sorry, to train, such as no cost training. Uh, so eight hours of training seems to be a barrier for some people, but once encouraged to do so and given incentives to do so, uh, people often can train. Again, going back to earlier point, we also find that getting trained doesn't mean they are prescribed, and I'll come back to the issue of bias in just a little bit. Um, protected time it seemed to be an issue. Again, eight hours, it seems to be a lot for people, including residents and uh, uh, trained providers, in finding the time to do so. And uh, we also discovered that some of the respondents pointed to the telehealth, uh, tele uh, web-based training modules as being ways, or Project ECHO is an example, as being ways that uh, they could get the training without having to sit in a room. And this provides access, especially for rural areas, and it was found to be important. The primary care climate was important. Um, again, this is interdisciplinary, and so people who were in environments where the specialties worked together, primary care, internal medicine, psychiatry worked together, seemed to see that as a very facilitative environment for training. And so coordinating with, with community health systems, for instance, also was a facilitator for training and uh, having favorable stakeholder attitudes, you know, people who are receptive to to MAT prescribing and MAT care or opioid use disorder care uh, were seen as being uh, facilitative uh, uh, environments for, for training. Now, um, there were also some other things that uh, they, they felt were, were important. Uh, prescribing laws was one that um, uh, was seen as important, and, and this, this seems intuitive, but, you know, NPs who are, if NPs are allowed to prescribe and PS allowed to prescribe, I think it made the environment easier so they, they're able to provide holistic care as opposed to seeing a patient and going back to the MD. And obviously uh, insurance companies that uh, uh, enable MAT prescribing 
uh, and, and you see that this, this is also the flip side of uh, some of these barriers as well. Um, of course, resources is always an issue, and, and, and so having the financial support to this is important. Uh, but again, this goes back to sustainability for some of these uh, uh, models and programs. Uh, I'm going to touch on some other key barriers uh, to um, MAT uh, training and, and prescribing. Um, in, interestingly, one of the things that we, we and I come to the issue of bias in a minute, and, and maybe if we have time, Heather can speak more to it. One of the issues that we found surprisingly was some of the rapid pace of primary care transformation, such as CPC Plus, as many of you know. Um, as people kind of um, go into these programs, it seems to crowd out the attention that MET training needs and uh, divert attention to it. That's not surprising because once you put a focus on one thing, others suffer. Uh, but luckily in these models, we also put an emphasis on behavioral health, and that hopefully will turn around as uh, there is more equipoise in the implementation of these uh, models. Uh, in a programs, for instance, federally qualified health centers that are starting, um, perhaps have more difficulty than those who are perhaps more established. Um, time constraints, obviously, is a barrier. But over and over again, I think one thing that came very clearly was the issue of bias. Uh, bias in the, in the, uh, from the uh, side of the provider stakeholders. People felt sometimes that you know, if you prescribe MAT, essentially substituting one thing for another instead of treating a condition. And I think that is really an important uh, piece for, um, for people to keep in mind as, you know, for instance, the videos. Uh, stigma is what I'm talking about from the videos that we were shown earlier from PCSS. Uh, so the stigma that uh, patients experience, providers experience, uh, create a barrier for training as well as for prescribing of MAT. And so this is really an important thing. Of course, community level resistance in treating MAT uh, is also an issue that uh, creates a barrier for, for this. Um, again, one of the uh, elements that we, a sub-theme that we found was that um, and it's easy to have these laws that say you should prescribe, right? Uh, but uh, or the laws actually say you shouldn't prescribe this much. But then you, there are not a lot of uh, uh, programs in place to create or increase access to MAT. So the two arms of the um, of the interventions for handling um, opioid disorder don't always uh, come together and align very well, and and so those also can be uh, barriers as well. From the perspective of these um, programs, uh, the issue of sustainability is always seem to be important to them, and uh, understandably so, because they are grant funded. They are programs are supported in a way by HRSA funding, and if that funding goes away, how would they sustain those programs? Where would they find the time for teaching the faculty support and the champions who are really important in moving these uh, programs uh, forward? Uh, so that is sort of to give you a taste of some of the things we've found. We're working on synthesizing uh, the findings from this report and from this study, and we hope to begin to look for ways to disseminate them uh, very soon. Uh, but we wanted to give you a bit of high-level summary of some of um, um, the implications of our study, uh, which is that, you know, the training in MAT at primary care sites require IBH models. Again, this was said earlier, but you need to have um, a holistic environment that allows for uh, treatment of patients with behavioral health issues because they coexist, not just with behavioral health issues, but also with medical issues. But having a holistic environment that provides IBH care models that are effective is really important uh, for doing so. Uh, having resources and champions is cr crucial. Um, you need a champion uh, to help enable these programs. And um, it's also important for us to know that MET training is really crucial because if we don't have people training these models now, uh, I think this problem we have will persist in terms of underdiagnosis, undertreatment, and being effective in working in these uh, models of care. Uh, we found many different models that have been used in the training programs. Uh, again, this is a, a process and evolution, and I think it will continue to evolve over time. Um, and, and stigma to, to us is it's the big issue that we should collectively work to solve. I think the videos shown are good examples, but having some core resources to address stigma 
enabling providers who are interested in working in this area to be effective and empowered to, to prescribe and assistance to support them would be really important. But more importantly, having systems that are friendly or receptive to patients or patient-centered would be really important in enabling uh, this epidemic to be handled uh, effectively. Um, Again, when we do primary care transformation, it's important, especially in this valley environment, to make the case uh, for the importance of treating opioid use disorder, which is a cost driver in, in many of the settings. And IP environments are really optimal for providing the type of training that is needed to, for providers to be effective in working in these behavioral health settings. Again, the key is that we need the, the programs in place, the IBH models in place, place for the training to occur. And these effective trainings do need to occur in the interprofessional setting. Again, we invite you to visit our website, which is ncibh.org. We do send out weekly, sort of monthly, uh, newsletters uh, to folks. And we look for people to showcase uh, in our program in terms of the exemplary work that they're doing to share those examples. And uh, we. Uh, provide links to resources on our website. We also engage in uh, tweets and uh, other social media outlets to try and get word out, especially, for instance, uh, we did so on Suicide Prevention Week. Heather Cluceris and the rest of the team uh, did an excellent job of uh, uh, doing some tweets to help uh, disseminate and spread word. Uh, again, we thank you for uh, um, giving us the chance to share some of our work with you and look forward to interacting with you. Thank you, Dr. Bedini. You have collected some great measures thus far, and I look forward to checking back with you about the measures that will be captured later on in this project. Very exciting work. Um, thank you to you and your team. So next up, we will hear from Gerald Ackerman at the University of Nevada as he shares his work as the Area Health Education Center Program Director and the Director of Nevada State Office of Rural Health. So uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk to you today. And, and boy, I'm very impressed with our previous presenters and have learned a lot. So my presentation is a little different. It's more some practical, uh, uh, practical things that we've worked to do to meet the needs of the rural areas of our state. Uh, so just a little history on our Nevada AHEC. We were initially funded in 1989. We're a great big state with only three centers, so our, our AHEC centers cover, cover large land masses, and uh, our, our AHECs are all about partnerships, so we're, there's no way we can get everything done with the amount of both federal and state dollars we get. It, we require a lot with partnerships, and, and I'll talk about those partnerships as we go on through these slides. Uh, I am... Well, I need to at first recognize the uh, state of Nevada and the STR grant has helped in a lot of the, the things that have been that we've done in response to these uh, issues that have faced Nevada. And so like all states, uh, Nevada has a big issue. Uh, we've made national news, which I'll talk about here in a minute, but uh, we either always in Nevada either hit or beat the national rate of everything. Uh, we always wished it was in some of the good health behaviors, uh, but oftentimes uh, it is, it is uh, in, in the other way. And as you can see from that slide, uh, the number of deaths have been increasing in Nevada, and we uh, have been decreasing a little bit in our uh, prescription opioids, but it's still a big problem. So in order to uh, respond to this, uh, the Nevada State Legislature, because Nevada providers wrote 83 opioid prescriptions per 100, 100 persons, uh, and the U.S. average was 70, uh, we felt like there, the state felt like there was a big problem and something needed to be done. And so like with all things, we have a problem. And the problem was we prescribed too many opioids. Uh, and then we come up with a solution, and as with all things, uh, what happens in rural Nevada and in our urban areas is we have a reaction to the solution. So this is what happened. Assembly Bill 474 was uh, passed, 
and establish definitions for overdose and patient discharge, establish information for required for mandatory reporting by certain healthcare professionals overdose or suspected overdose, overdose incidents, establish required time frame and submission methods for the reports of overdose, overdose or suspected overdose incidents, establish requirements for certain medical facilities to establish policies related to reporting overdose, overdose or suspected overdose incidents, and establish requirements for the state chief medical officer established procedures to track and report statewide information to related overdose or suspected overdose incidences. So what happened because of this bill was uh, it passed and as you can see even as recently as 2018 uh, some of our providers felt like things went a little too far the other way as we swing, swung that pendulum and uh, this was uh, one of our doctors from uh, Clark County uh, who said, we appreciate the regulation, we appreciate the fact that something is being done to control an enormous problem, but I think as a group we feel it is a bit too broad and has been extended way too far. And that was uh, told to the board. Uh, so many of our rural Nevada physicians, in response to the passage of this bill and some of the other national uh, things going on, was they didn't want to jeopardize their medical licenses. And uh, this was a quote from our Joan Hall, who is president of our Nevada Rural Hospital Partners, in 2017 at the Rural Health Summit that I'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, they just decided that they were going to stop prescribing altogether. So this has created a great problem. Uh, so a lot of our primary care docs who had some patients who were long-term, uh, opioid users now all of a sudden didn't have a, a, a home for primary care uh, for their opioids at least and it w was started impacting the emergency rooms and that's where people were showing up to try to to try to to get access to the the drugs that they had become dependent upon so one of the things that we did in a partnership was uh, I don't know how many of you know but uh, the National Organization for State Office of Rural Health uh, several years ago started something called National Rural Health Day. And uh, one of the things that we did working with our partners was to hold an opioid abuse uh, prevention summit uh, to respond to uh, the particular crises, both the opioid prescribing as well as the providers who all of a sudden decided, I, I can't prescribe opioids anymore. And also, the, I think the greatest uh, effort here was to try to meet the needs of patients who were having uh, issues that they hadn't experienced before. So the major partners we had in this project uh, were our, was our School of Medicine, the state of Nevada, uh, HRSA through the funding that they provided to the state of Nevada, our Office of Rural Health, our AIDS Education and Training Center, our CROFLEX program. Uh, our uh, Center for the Application of Substance Abuse Technologies, and our community health centers. And as you can see, those are major uh, programs of HRSA, and then there were many others. Uh, the results of this summit, it was a one-day summit. Uh, there were uh, participants from every corner of Nevada, uh, and we also had communities representatives from uh, Montana uh, and California, and uh, we were happy to have those on. Uh, one of the things that we did realize was because we're such a big state and we're so spread out as we use some technology from Project ECHO uh, that we have here in Nevada and I'll visit about Project ECHO here in a minute and we connected 35 people online and this was a this is was it really exciting to us and we're actually going to use it in our summit this next year it's a fairly it's a web-based computer program uh, a couple of cameras and microphones, there's no big studio, uh, and it actually worked really, really well. So for very little cost and just a uh, 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 web access, uh, we were able to broadcast that out, and so we had a lot more participation. And most of those 35 online attendees were uh, primary care uh, providers who were out throughout rural Nevada. So uh, this was our uh, National Rural Health Day. As you can see in the back, a few people are brave enough to show their pictures. This is kind of what our echo sessions look like. But uh, this, this uh, was from our state health division and then one of our addiction specialists who were, was talking at this project. It was very well received, and we felt really 
pretty good about our our quick response and uh, about the partnership and maybe about starting a conversation and and at least trying to get out ahead of this until you wake up in the morning and that was we hit the national spotlight for rural Nevada uh, in the community I live in in Elko Nevada we were one of the first <laughs> a major uh, the drug task force uh, with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney General. Uh, we had one of our physicians that were uh, was uh, arrested, and uh, it was his first arrest of the Federal uh, Opioid Fraud and Abuse Detection Unit in the country. And we had the dubious distinction of being the site of the first arrest of that specialized unit. And uh, if convicted, uh, this particular uh, provider could uh, have 300 years in prison. And we're still feeling the effects of this provider uh, being arrested and, and his patients having to find access to both treatment and for primary care. Uh, and mainly it's, it really hit our FQHC here locally in the community. So the nice thing about this is I would like to visit about partnerships is we were contacted by our regional uh, office uh, of HRSA, uh, uh, Lorenzo Taylor, who has been a good friend of Nevada forever. Uh, and uh, has always been extremely supportive, and I just can't say enough of our, our regional office. Uh, and he said, you know what, we've seen this. We want to come to Elko and participate in, uh, in, in helping you uh, to combat, combat the opioid abuse in, uh, in rural Nevada. And so in collaboration with our state targeted response to the opioid crisis grant, uh, we held a summit here. And uh, the results of this summit uh, were that uh, Lorenzo came out, and our partners included law enforcement of the state of Nevada, the Center for Substance Abuse Technology, the AHEC, the Office of Rural Health, and then a new program that we have here in the community, which is Vitality Integrated Programs, which is a CCBHC, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, which is a, a waiver program uh, with CMS uh, that has really allowed us to do some wonderful things in getting some mental health resources. So uh, Mr. Taylor also came here to learn firsthand about the local needs and challenges facing rural Nevada. And uh, really the nice thing about this was to, to educate the community about the federal resources we had. And I thought that was a great outcome of this particular uh, summit uh, in that we learned about a lot of resources that we weren't aware of. So over 60 city, county, and state stakeholders participated in the summit. So what do we do for long term? Uh, as you can see, I always like to show this slide for rural Nevada. You know, we're a, we're a state that's urban. Uh, about 10% of our population, though, lives in rural Nevada. So after, after you leave the wonderful uh, bright lights of Las Vegas and or Reno, uh, you can see our New England uh, states fit in the rest of the state. Uh, I always love our sign, next gas 163 miles, and it's truly if you don't fill up, you're in trouble. So one of the things that we've talked about and I've seen in the chat box is Project ECHO. And so a long time ago, we, Nevada actually, I think we were the third or fourth replication site of uh, Dr. Sanjeev Aurora's uh, wonderful program with Project ECHO actually was able to see the first demonstration of that at a, at a Office of Rural Health meeting that I was at. And we adopted that fairly early because we look a little bit uh, like uh, the state that he started his program in. And so for the long term, this is what uh, our Office of Rural Health and our AHEC program uh, supports. Uh, we uh, still have a access issues. We still are struggling with trying to get people uh, to do medical assisted treatment and to get that MAT certification uh, and to get access for those physicians to have comfort in uh, working with patients and prescribing and working with the opioid issues. But in order to support them, one of the things that the, the grant did was to start a, a medical assisted treatment uh, uh, echo session and that is held the second and fourth Wednesdays. It's try to, trying to get those uh, providers who have gone through that training, continue to keep them with a comfort level and work with them as they're working with those patients. One that was, uh, is, was a, a short-term grant was an opioid disorder in pregnant women. Uh, that was a, a, 
uh, a two uh, series uh, echo clinic and we'll probably end up repeating that again. The third is one that we started quite a while ago at the request of the hospitals and that is we do actually have a pain management team that meets with primary care providers from around the state uh, twice a month to actually help them work with uh, those, those patients that, are in, that have pain management issues. Uh, that is a great team and it consists of a psychologist, a uh, primary care doctor, and a pain management specialist. And the nice thing about this is the pain management specialist actually is a private uh, practice pain management specialist and is, uh, uh, donates his time to this particular clinic and we ap appreciate him. And then the other thing that I wanted to bring up uh, to meet the needs maybe before people get to the pain management issues and, and some of the topics were discussed. We also have a behavioral health and primary care clinic that's offered twice a month. And uh, that one has been really uh, very well received by our rural residents in working with some of the mental health issues in rural Nevada as we have a no psychiatrist uh, outside of uh, Reno and Las Vegas uh, in, in rural Nevada other than through uh, telemental health. So uh, here's our link to uh, uh, Nevada uh, Project Echo. Uh, I was going to try to show a video, but supposedly video uh, does not work very well on, on this particular format. But there are some recorded sessions there. I think the biggest struggle for us is, is engaging all of the rural primary care folks. We have some great content, uh, and we have some great clinics. Uh, participation uh, goes up and down, as you would guess, with all rural sites. Uh, and, and most of it's to do with staffing, with provider, uh, providers being busy, but we, they have been going on for a long time and we're having great success for Project ECHO, so I'd encourage anybody that's maybe looking for that long-term uh, solution to engage at least your rural areas to look at that Project ECHO model. I know both on our website and on, uh, on the University of New Mexico, uh, they have some great resources. and. I will tell you, uh, the University of New Mexico can be uh, is awesome at uh, mentorship and working with states and, and doing some replication. So, uh, great team there, and in Nevada, we would be willing to work with you and help you if you have some questions. The other thing that we've done for the last, uh, I think we're on our 29th, 27th year. I'm sorry, that was this year's conference that just happened is most, as most of you are aware, that a lot of our rural care happens through EMS. And oftentimes our EMTs and paramedics are the first, first ones to, to come into contact. And in many of our sites, uh, they're some of our only providers that are there. So we just did a, a, our 27th annual EMS conference. We do this every year. We bring in national speakers. And we end up usually with about two to 300 rural EMTs for three days trying to give them some, some top-notch education. And so we just uh, finished through the STR grant uh, educating about 38 uh, services and or communities. And altogether, that was about 300 rural EMTs that received uh, training uh, dealing with opioids and opioid-related opioid issues. Uh, Mr. Ackerman, we yes. we apologize for kind of interrupting your presentation, but trying to be mindful, we have one more presenter, uh, and looking at the time we have, we may have to kind of cut your presentation short. I'm sorry. I didn't think I was going over my 10 minutes, but I will hurry. I Not, Yeah. Um, it, we actually are just going to have to go to the next presenter because we want to make sure we have time for them as well. Okay. So, I, I'm all done then. Okay. Thank all you. All right. Thank you. So thank you so much for that enlightening presentation. And your presentation will be available for download, so those that um, would, would like to go through each slide will have the opportunity to do so after the presentation. Um, next up, we will hear from Dr. Mary Weber as she shares from the University of Colorado uh, the responses at the state level to the opioid crisis. Thank you, Lauren. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I am a consultant on our HRSA grant, or our ACE grant, which is our Access Coordinated Care and Evidence-Based Practice grant to integrate um, primary care, behavioral health, and substance treatment into our nurse-managed federally qualified health center. Our PI is Dr. Amy Barton. Um, and so this is a, um, going to talk about kind of state as well as local levels. Okay. 
So you've heard the objectives. I'm going to talk a little bit more of Colorado and more of a nursing focus as well. I think we mentioned and we've had reports uh, from other presenters that there are many people that have an opioid use disorder, but they're, um, the latest national data is that less than 80% actually get treatment. We have a surge in heroin use, and I'll show you what's happening in Colorado um, in terms of overdose deaths. And so this is um, a state and national and local issue. So for Colorado stats, um, we're 12th nationally in self-reported non-medical use of opioids. And a quarter of individuals who live in Colorado admit to using pain medications in non-prescribed ways. And it's been noted in our criminal justice system that you know, seizures of prescription drugs has you know, just quadrupled from 2011 to 2015, although this trend seems to be decreasing. Our data in Colorado is similar to the na some of the national data that you saw um, in terms of the CDC reports. Our biggest problem with overdoses is related to um, pain medication, um, oral medication, and the rate continues to go up. We are not seeing a decrease. Um, we are unfortunately also seeing an, an increase in overdose deaths from methamphetamine. And we're seeing lots of lethal combinations of these uh, opioid prescription medications that are um, cut down and, and methamphetamine added to it. And so we have a, kind of a, a double-edged sword here as, as well. So we have begun this at a state level and at a local level to combat this um, because this has been, it, it's, not, uh, it's not just one front to, uh, to really combat this issue. Um, we have a statewide substance abuse task force from the Attorney General's office, and, and that's where we, we really began coordinating efforts, efforts beginning at the criminal justice system, in our jails, as well as our primary care settings and our education systems. So we first started in 2016 with trying to get naloxone out to law enforcement agencies, and you see that in that short period of time, the number of law enforcement agencies using naloxone significantly increased. And we are continuing to, to reach out, and we've had tremendous support from all the sheriffs and the local uh, law enforcement agencies all across the state. They want naloxone. They want a way to combat this and we're working on many fronts to do that. There's also a, uh, an, an app that's called the OP Rescue app that uh, does give people information about how to use naloxone and also reports the use of that. And you see that in 2017, we were able to record that there were 260 drug overdoses through the app much less than actual um, reversals that are happening with naloxone. When we have testified at state legislative levels, um, we're hearing from EMS that they're doing five and six a day for naloxone. One of the things that we are doing as well um, at the state level is um, a very much coordinated effort, and it's called the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse. So you see that it involves the governor, the attorney general, and both houses in the legislature, but it is also a community action group of providers and patients, um, family members, and any community agencies across the state that want to get involved. It is housed in our School of Pharmacy at the University of Colorado, but the School of Medicine, the College of Nursing, School of Dentistry, all of us are involved in this as well. Um, we've been focusing on things like the PDMP, and, and a law was passed several years ago, um, whether to, that providers need to be checking the PDMP. You see that we have a recovery-oriented group. We have a harm reduction group that is looking at um, naloxone reversals, safe disposal issues, provider education work group where we're providing education across the state, a heroin response team, and, so, and then a treatment work group that focuses really on access. And um, out of that have come some policy changes as well as some state legislative bills over the last few years and more coming in the pipeline. So from this coordinated state effort, we've been working with the state legislature to fund more MAT training and MAT clinics. 
One of those was a bill that was passed in 2017, Senate Bill 1774, that increased the, uh, some, some monies to provide MAT training and MAT clinics that focused on nurse practitioners and physician assistants in rural Colorado areas. There's also um, a state funding for increased access to naloxone in schools because that's become an issue. Um, community health centers, primary care centers, behavioral health clinics. And we do have state funding that incentivizes physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs to take the MAT waiver training. It's paid for the hour of your training. Um, and it's paid if you get a DEA waiver. So it's paid throughout the whole process in order to be able to prescribe buprenorphine products. We have focused on education of our providers to be. The University of Colorado College of Nursing made a national pledge with our accrediting body, which is AACN, to educate students, all our students, on the CDC guidelines for prescribing opiates for chronic pain, which you heard about earlier. Under a SAMHSA grant that I received that focused on an expert or screening brief intervention referral to treatment, we integrated this content and threaded that through our undergraduate nursing programs as well as our graduate nurse practitioner and advanced practice programs at the College of Nursing. One of our master students was awarded um, a NIDA AACN grant to develop an opioid, opioid online module um, for really specifically was providing for nursing and, and graduate nursing students, but this is also used in many communities. And I've given you an example, and I have a, a link to this. It really is a novice to expert approach. It's very, very good. It's, it's used in prime, can be used in primary care, can be used in nursing, can be used at all populations. Talks about children, adolescents, older adults, pregnant women, women of childbearing age, the role of naloxone, how to use naloxone products, how to teach provide how to teach patients and families how to use naloxone, why do these particular medications work and, and medication-assisted treatment some, in some ways to combat some of the stigma related to this. This is the um, online module training um, that can be done. And again, this is free, and this is really nice for all levels of providers. So, in our grant, we also focused at our federally qualified health center to integrate um, assessing for substance, assessing and treating for behavioral health issues, as well as obviously the primary care issues. We started with trainings with expert and substance education at multiple intervals with our nurse practitioners, with our nursing staff, with our front desk staff, with our MAs. We talked about how to screen for depression and anxiety and talk to primary care providers about actual treatment of this anxiety and depression. Um, we, in a more of a consultation model, use to have a psychiatric nurse practitioner, an RN and case manager in our adult and school-based health clinics for treatment, referral, and consultation. And we're working towards a full integrated behavioral health, psychiatric, and substance um, model in primary care for both adults and in our school-based health clinic. So we've been able to make a, a dent, we believe, in the behavioral health side. We uh, PCL is, assesses for uh, PTSD symptoms. The HAMD assesses for depression. The BDRS assesses for bipolar depression. And we've shown some significant improvements in that over the last two years in our primary care clinic. And we feel that we've really done a, a good job of integrating that. Um, and so we started to, as we're introducing SBIRT and things, what can we do for the opioid um, issues that we're, we're seeing? So we looked and did a needs assessment in a three-year period, and this was just those diagnosed with a substance use disorder. You know, almost 13% of our adult clinic had this diagnosis. However, we feel this is really under-reporting. Um, and of those that had a diagnosis of a substance use disorder, a third had an opioid use disorder and really doesn't address um, those that have a problem use or were not asked and was not implemented. And so we decided to implement MAT in our primary care setting, in our integrated clinic, began with meetings with leadership and providers and staff with the importance of providing this service. 
we decided to use a hub and spoke model, which has been used in um, Vermont and other places that, sh that has a collaboration with an OTP or, or an opioid treatment program that provides methadone, because we felt that you know, our providers would feel overwhelmed if someone did not succeed on buprenorphine or naltrexone products and may need methadone as an option, and we needed a referral source to be able to do that much more difficult in our rural settings with our rural clinics that we're having because they may have to go three or four hundred miles for an OTP. And so this certainly works in a more urban setting but, but much more difficult in, in a rural setting. And we work to generate interest among our providers because for the NPs, we had never ever had this in our education system because prior to 2016, there we were federally not allowed to prescribe buprenorphine products, either were physician assistants, and so this new law changed everything. And so this was very new. All the providers didn't have this in their educational systems. And so this really was starting at the ground up to see how we could get people involved. And so we worked with all the providers, with the nurses, with the case managers, behavioral health providers. We had to develop protocols, treatment agreements. We used the PCSS system that you had earlier and some of the ASAM work that we've done. We looked at all of the options, talked to providers in the community, began educating providers on, on, on these MAP medication, how to use the, the CALS or the clinical opiate withdrawal scale for withdrawal management and how to implement MAT in both primary care and psychiatric care. We needed to do dry runs um, because this was very new. Again, this is a process very new to nurse practitioners and physician assistants, and so we needed to do dry runs to see how that would work. That was actually quite helpful. Um, we have had barriers, and most of the barriers have been talked about. Um, there certainly is a provider fear of an unfamiliar drug in a practice, and changing practice takes takes quite a while, changing culture, changing practices, and some individual stigma. Um, we also saw what we're seeing nationally is providers starting the 24-hour MAT training but not finishing. And even with Colorado having financial incentives to finish, um, we're still having problems with our providers finishing the MAT training. And we're looking at this at a state level and how we can facilitate this. Another barrier was the additional time and resources for an induction process for buprenorphine, and how can we make this financially feasible? And this is really what we're working on now, even at the state level, is trying to streamline this process of induction, how to do this safely, how to do this in a way that a primary care provider feels comfortable for this, and um, plans for continued mentorship of providers wanting to prescribe MAT. I have included a slide um, with resources, and, and so some of the resources have already been talked about, um, and I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for that great presentation. Um, we really enjoyed hearing from you, and thank you for the rich resources that you were able to provide. Um, we'd now like to ask one question. We have just a few more minutes here. We're going to be able to ask one question to all of our presenters. I'll pass it over to Kent. Uh, and hello, and thank you for uh, participating. And here's the one question for our panel: If you could provide a uh, you know 30 second to a minute and response due to our our short uh, um, shortness of time. But here's uh, if you would respond to one of these three options: uh, considerations and how to recruit providers who possess MAT waivers. There were a number of questions about that topic. Also, um, fundamentally, how to create or sustain oral health partnerships, and also along the lines of pediatrics and the partnership to ensure that that population is appropriately uh, addressed. So uh, perhaps, Dr. Lowsby, if you had some comment on one of those three things. One of the ways that CDC is working with its uh, partners is to really understand what are those um, educational and interests or needs of clinicians. And so, and working with um, medical professions and other um, clinical professions, trying to identify um, 
So where along the continuum there might be opportunities to introduce either pain management curriculum or um, medication assistant treatment uh, curriculum in both the curriculum in medical school and then residency and then in specialty training. So we're, we, in terms of CDC's intervention or response, is looking at the sort of broad continuum of medical education. Um, are there any other presenters that would like to respond to the question? Hi, this is Catherine Cates Wessel with PCSS. I had put on the um, log at the bottom. They can contact me to connect them with people on um, the American Dental Association with some of our pediatricians about pediatrics. Access for uh, waiver people, I would also suggest um, contacting us, and we can put you in touch with how to request more information and technical assistance. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. It does. Great. I have to hang up. I'm sorry. I have another No problem. Call. I apologize. Okay. Were there any other presenters that wanted to respond? And once again, we thank you all for, for joining us. And we want to mention that the chat, I mean, at the poll questions are open. So if um, participants are able to respond to those, that would be great. And um, the line's open for a few more minutes for other presenters to respond to the question. This is Mary Weber. I did want to say that there are a number of evidence-based models that work in school-based health centers and in schools, um, kind of on early intervention and treatment of children and adolescents that have some beginning substance use disorders. And so I think that um, that those can that there are a number that have been used and and you know happy to to share or you can certainly look those up. The Colorado Consortium under their website will have some of that information um, and does have a lot of things in that in that website there. Thank you, Dr. Weber. So we wanted to say thank you for the questions and answers for our presenters. Um, and we're sure the audience can take away some of the great content that was covered today surrounding the nationwide opioid crisis and each state's responses that were shared today were great. Um, the resources will be available for download as well as the presentation in the file share area of the screen. Um, and we, in HERSA, we at HERSA look forward to continuing to support combating the opioid ex epidemic and integrating op opioid use disorder treatment into health workforce training. So please continue to let HERSA know how we can support you. Thank you again to all that were involved with this presentation. Have a great day. And the chat pod will remain open after the webinar just for a couple more minutes for those to um, continue to ask questions. Thank you for your participation. That does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.